Support for this podcast comes from Verizon Business. Verizon Business Unlimited plans, unlimited data, no overages, and more. Built right for business with the speed of Verizon 5G. Get Verizon Business Unlimited plans from as low as $30 per line. Visit verizon.com slash business slash plans. Per month with five lines on Business Unlimited start. Includes paper-free billing with auto pay and select smartphone agreement discounts. Taxes, fees, and terms apply. 5G nationwide available in 2,700 plus cities on most Verizon 5G devices. 5G ultra-wideband available only in parts of select cities. Hi, I'm Emilio. I'm a program manager at Google. Right now, lots of people are looking for ways to learn new job skills. That's why we created Google Career Certificates, an online training program for fast-growing fields like IT support, project management, data analytics, user experience design, and more. You don't need any prior experience, and you can be job ready in about six months. So put your skills to work. Go to grow.google slash certificates. Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to New Books Archaeology, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Samuel Pfister, and joining me today to talk about his trilogy on the history of Egyptology, titled Wonderful Things, is Jason Thompson. Jason is the editor of Edward William Lane's Description of Egypt and an Account on the Manners and Customs of the Modern Egyptians, and is the author of Sir Gardner Wilkinson and His Circle and A History of Egyptology from Earliest Times to the Present. All three volumes of Wonderful Things, A History of Egyptology, are out now from American University in Cairo Press. Jason, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm very good. I'm glad to be with you. How are you, Sam? Uh, Doing well. Can't complain. Uh, So let's get right into the questions here. Uh, So tell us about Wonderful Things. Give us an overview of the series. Well, Wonderful Things is is a survey... Uh, history of the history of Egyptology, not of ancient Egypt, but of the process of the sometimes called rediscovery of ancient Egypt, uh, the intellectual creation of ancient Egypt even. Um, And it it covers from uh, antiquity until the present. That raises the interesting question, of course, of when did Egyptology actually begin? Uh, many, perhaps most, hold out for uh, 1798 and Napoleon's invasion and brief conquest of Egypt with the activities of the uh, uh, commission, uh, the scientific commission that accompanied him, and that resulted in the great uh, description uh, de l'Egypte, uh, which is a, literally a a publication, a monument of Egyptology. There are others who hold for 1822 and the publication of Champollion's Lettre à Monsieur Dossier, which with great oversimplification is taken to be the decipherment of hieroglyphs. If I were to look at recent times, I, I would think toward the end of the 19th century with the professionalization of Egyptology, uh, which in fact is the the beginning of one of my books. But I wanted to take into account Egyptology in a very broader sense, you know, the involvement with ancient Egypt, which stretches into antiquity. I mean, Egypt was ancient even during antiquity. A New Kingdom scribe uh, looking at the uh, step pyramid at, at, at Sa'ara uh, and uh, inscribing a bit of graffito on the wall uh, about his uh, amazement, was looking already looking back a thousand years. And uh, Egyptian antiquity was so important to Rome, it's present in medieval times, and ever more so in Renaissance and Enlightenment. And I wanted to take uh, those things into account as well. Hence, uh, the, uh, 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 the millennia of time involved. Yeah, and, and now, these books aren't the first titles on Egypt and about Egyptology that, that you've written uh, or edited. So where did this lifelong interest in Egypt and, and the history of ancient Egypt and Egyptology come from? Uh, that, that, well, that's a, that's a question that, that's, that's occurred to me uh, over time. Uh, but leading, 
you know, to 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 these to this particular uh, these particular three volumes, uh, there are two threads uh, that that were closely involved. One accidental serendipity, and the other programmatic. Uh, it actually began one hot summer. 1977 in East Texas, when I happened to be reading Brian Fagan's The Rape of the Nile, just come out then. And that was my first exposure to, to Egyptian archaeology. Anyway, uh, several years later, when I was at the University of Chicago and needed a seminar paper, I remembered a footnote, no, actually an endnote in, in, uh, in, in Brian's book, uh, where he mentioned that there was not a biography of Sir Gardiner Wilkinson, or John Gardiner Wilkinson, as he was before he was knighted. And um, I thought, well, I'll do a little essay on that. But that left some uninterested questions, so I pursued it into my PhD dissertation. And then there was still more to do, more research, new frontiers, and residence in Egypt. And that led to uh, uh, my book about Gardner Wilkinson in 1992. But in doing uh, Wilkinson, I'd become interested in his friend, the British Egyptologist Edward William Lane. And that was a large project that consumed uh, a, a good many years with two books and and maybe a, a dozen articles about various aspects of him and his circle, because it was actually a prosographical work, a work of collective biography, not just a biography. But even with Lane and Orientalism, there's no escape from Egyptian antiquity because he was deeply involved in it. And so when the Lane project ended, and also I was able to complete my survey history of Egypt from earliest times to present, I wanted to make a statement about Egyptology as an event in cultural history and as something that I had become interested in and that I thought I had some perspective from my outside uh, point of view. Bear in mind, I am, by certificate, a historian of, of Britain and the British Empire, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East, and Egypt. And uh, so uh, it was, uh, for me, a an opportunity, I thought, to, uh, to close out a longstanding threat, threat of inquiry. And uh, I was received a contract to write a one-volume history of ancient Egypt, of, of, excuse me, of the history of Egyptology. Now, the other is programmatic. As a historian of the British Empire, but someone who is also interested in the Middle East, both uh, contemporary and ancient, um, I wanted to be neither one nor the other. I wanted to place myself between them and study the process of encounter. And that takes many aspects, but the study of Egyptian antiquity is an encounter. In fact, a double dose of encounter, because on the one hand, the process of Egyptology is part of modern Egyptian and Middle Eastern history. But also there's a strong element of encounter with the ancient Egyptians. It's rather difficult to, to describe, but th there's nothing else, uh, you know, quite so poignant that, uh, as, as that. The feeling of, on the one hand, familiarity, almost welcomed, especially by their artistic representations, and yet as one gets to know them better, finding that they're so utterly alien uh, from us. Yeah, and, and one thing I can really tell uh, you know, in, in reading this series is that you do approach it as a biographer. There are really great backgrounds on a lot of the Egyptologists, but you also do a great job of sort of weaving this with you know, embedding their stories and their lives 
in the current events of their time and how that shaped their work and how their work, you know, in, in turn shaped those events. Um, you know, one of the things I was so impressed by was just the comprehensiveness of all of the detail uh, in, in each volume. There's so many characters, so many Egyptologists, so many excavation projects to keep straight and, you know, important events to chronologize and contextualize all of this work. And you really wove these details with sometimes intimate and sympathetic or critical narratives. Um, so with such a large project like this, can you describe your approach to your research a little bit? Describe your research strategy. Well, uh, of first, there's um, the, the 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 resources and the support uh, that one derives from what's gone before, and others who are working in the field or, or, or similar uh, fields now, because history of Egyptology is a rapidly a rapidly growing field, and so there there are a lot of uh, predecessors Egyptology. Professional Egyptology has always been retrospective. Those early volumes uh, published uh, by the Egypt Exploration Fund, as it was then, almost always carried a, a good uh, hit, hit, uh, retrospective in understanding what had, what had gone before. Uh, Egypt, uh, Egyptology has a biographical uh, a dictionary. Who was who? In Egyptology, it's an extraordinary resource, I think, now being put into its fifth revised edition by, by Morris Beerbrier, an unusually uh, rich uh, uh, resource uh, for it. the history of Egyptology is obituaries. I mean, other disciplines, their journals have obituaries, but Egyptologists haven't extraordinary uh, facility for, for writing obituaries. They are the best. And then the, the, the interaction, there, there are more uh, conferences, sections at conferences, and more, more interaction uh, between uh, researchers. I've, I've, I've benefited uh, from all of that. And then moving ahead, of course, there's the vast extent of Egyptological literature. How many lifetimes would it take to read it all? Fortunately, or it's, it's very well organized with, with bibliographical guides and uh, reasonably well cross references, so we can follow the debates, but above all the development and indeed the, the creation of, 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 of knowledge. Um, now, how, how does one cope with, with such a, as best as best one can, uh, trying to keep aware of the the field overall, but also understanding that the true significance, say, of a particular book might not be in its thesis, but in a passing comment and a footnote on page two hundred and seventy-two. But you know, it's there and ready to be mined. The most exciting thing, I suppose, is, is the archival dimension. And there are, there are a number, and an, an increasing number, of Egyptological archives. Uh, for me, uh, the first and the last uh, will always be the Griffith Institute of the Ashmolean Museum at, at Oxford. And that's where I spent uh, uh, most so much of my time working on Wilkinson and later preparing my book about Edward William Lane. But there are others of the British, the archives of the British Museum, Rich, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So there's another new and very strong archive uh, in, in Milan, uh, the great libraries of the world, the British library in particular, is rich for early uh, 19th, uh, 19th century archaeology. Uh, the research centers, uh, the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, 
is, is very good for 20th century archaeology and more specialized in their field work at the epigraphic survey at Luxor, an extraordinary textual and visual archive. I suspect we'll be hearing a lot from that direction uh, in a few years as the epigraphic survey or Chicago House, as it's popularly called, uh, uh, celebrates its 100th anniversary. Now here too, there's the problem of, 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 of size. And I haven't even mentioned the large number of uh, private collections and sometimes uh, in local archives that are just now uh, being identified. Uh, there's more here than most uh, individual researchers' time and money would allow to cover. But fortunately, an increasing amount of this is being uh, done online, and uh, researchers at remote uh, corners of the world uh, can, can readily access a particularly value, valuable resource at this moment. Yeah, truly the, the abundance of writing on Egypt and Egyptological writing that's been produced over the, you know, the past however many centuries and, and millennia is um, both is extraordinary, but um, it, well, you know, it you know, is wrangling indeed. that and synthesizing it into it. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I, I should add one of the most important elements of all, and that's the sense of place, you know, long-term residents in Egypt you know, see, seeing the sites and understanding that sites, places have histories and lives of their own. Although I'm always careful to add that these are infused by, by individuals who identify them, give them meaning and provide them with, with stories. So over the years, I'm, I'm glad to have been able to have traveled ex as extensively as I can up and down the Nile and in, and in both deserts. I'm especially fortunate to have been a member, long-term member of the Dakla Oasis Project, uh, which is doing valuable uh, work in the Western desert. And some of my happiest writing times ha have, have been there. And then personal residence, you know, not only in various neighborhoods in Cairo, such as Mohandasin or Mahdi, but more recently, and in some ways more meaningfully, uh, in, the, uh, in the Eastern Cemetery in, in Kite Bay, where uh, my adoptive uh, Egyptian family uh, have a building. And there, in, in that particular milieu, and especially uh, uh, close by, uh, by, by the vast cemeteries, I also got an important uh, insight into, uh, into Egyptian life. There's no such thing as eternal Egypt. Things change, but other things stay the same. And as I would see people visiting their ancestors' tombs and bringing food and offerings and enjoying picnics there with them. You know, I would, that's one of many, many things that, uh, that provide a strong sense of con continuity uh, when you can live as closely as possible with the Egyptian people. Hello, everybody. This is Marshall Poe. I'm the founder and editor of the New Books Network. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably love to read. I know I do. So I'd like to recommend you subscribe to Scribd. Scribd is the ultimate reading subscription service, letting you explore all of your interests in any format you choose, ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and more for only $9.99 a month. All your favorite things are there. 
you get an entire library for less than the cost of a single book. No complicated credit cards or additional purchases required. If you're not sure what to read, Scribd combines the latest technology with the best human minds to recommend content that you'll love. Want to change things up? You're free to switch between titles, genres, and formats at any time on your phone, tablet, or computer. And here's the best news. Right now, Scribd is offering NBN listeners a free 60-day trial. Go to try.scribd.com slash NBN for your free trial. That's try.scribd.com slash NBN to get 60 days of Scribd for free. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. According to studies, less than 13% of all inventors who hold a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. But we can fix that by increasing participation in innovation and patenting by underrepresented groups. It would quadruple the number of American inventors and increase annual GDP by almost $1 trillion. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to invent and patent. Because the more diverse the American patent system gets, the stronger and more successful our nation will become. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. Learn more and take action today. Yeah, and it goes back to what you were saying before that it, you know, the study of the past of Egypt it really has to include um, an understanding and study of, of the present of Egypt as well. Um, so the title of this series, uh, "Wonderful Things," comes from the almost legendary discovery of the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Why was this moment so important in the history of Egyptology? And, and what made this discovery so unique or so extraordinary that it's been canonized the way it has as, as one of the most pivotal moments in the history of Egyptology? Uh, I, I have to say, I, I do love that title. And I think it is a brilliant title. I can say that with perfect modesty because it was suggested by my good friend and able copy editor, Abdallah Hassan. And uh, I, I, th I think it added uh, a, a great, a great touch to it. And but those are beautiful and memorable words. Um, why was that uh, discovery so important? Well, at the time, many Egyptologists asked that same question, um, and and not with good intent. Uh, George Reisner, for example, his extraordinary work uh, with the tomb of Queen Hetep Harris at, at, at Giza created no popular sensation at all, although it was done with extraordinary care and was a great work of, of, of scholarship and, and, and archaeology. Uh, uh, Later, uh, uh, Montet uh, uh, Tadis, with his discovery <clears throat> uh, of, of the uh, intact uh, uh, tombs there, created almost uh, no, no, no impression um, uh, as, uh, on the public. So what made it so extraordinary? Uh, well, the, of course, there's the element of gold and it came at the right moment. At, uh, at Tanis, it was a matter of silver, which doesn't have quite the, the same cachet. And also, it's a matter of fashion. Part of these uh, recurring waves of Egyptomania uh, that, uh, that, that are a periodic reality of uh, Egypt, Egyptological, Egyptological history. What drew me more and more was uh, the, the role of Howard Carter and, and the, the, the effect that it had on, on, on his life and, and on his, his reputation. He was, he was so poorly regarded 
by Egyptologists who would not have considered him even one of him, and to some degree uh, not of their class, uh, uh, with with a couple with a couple of, uh, of exceptions. Yet, even if he had never discovered that tomb, which in some ways became his curse, another important part of the sensation, even if he had never discovered that tomb, he already had accomplished more than most, uh, most Egyptologists uh, uh, can, can, never, can never dream of doing. So, so that, to me, w- 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 was the ulti- ultimate story about the discovery. But it, it was sensational, and it continues to be so. I don't know how many times at the Egyptian Museum uh, uh, I, I would be stopped by, by someone newly arrived there and say, where is the Tutankhamun uh, collection? Yeah, and, and you teased that uh, the mummy's curse a little bit that ended up biting Howard Carter was not um, sort of the legendary mummy's curse that suppose, supposedly made others who were involved with its discovery sick. Do you mind uh, telling a little bit about the story of Howard Carter after his discovery of the, the tomb? Yeah, well, Car- Carter I s- could be... A, 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 sh- a rather short-tempered man, and he the, the success came back to bite him. First, as he attempted to excavate, or excuse me, clear, clear, clear the tomb. Now, on the one hand, he had extraordinary support. Uh, the, the 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 well-equipped uh, ex- ex- uh, expedition. On the other side of the ridge, at, at Der El Bahari, uh, 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 provided him with material support, personnel, and especially, of course, uh, the superb uh, uh, photographic uh, record provided by Harry Burton. Uh, the uh, the Antiquities Service uh, also stepped up uh, with support, but. The uh, the sensation, the irritation, the gawking stu- uh, tourist who could not be kept at bay, um, afraid at his nerves. And by the end of the first season, his helpers were saying, "Thank heaven, it, it, it's over because uh, we we really we really do uh, need need a break." Um, the problem. I think was that saddened his life in, in later years and made those years a bit pathetic was a, a sense of diffidence, of insecurity, um, in that um, he felt he had, was deficient in education. He was didn't necessarily, he think, know the right things to say and do. He had, after all, been hired as an artist in the first instance because one of his qualifications was he was not a gentleman. In other words, a a cut down in the class. And uh, he never wrote up the the real report, the, the full account, uh, of, the, of the discovery. In some ways, it, it never has been properly reported, but it's, it's so famous and well-known that it, they, it, it doesn't matter in regard to the, to the individual uh, artifacts. And he couldn't bring himself to do it. He had a couple of expert and experienced uh, writers uh, wanted to help him. Alan Gardner tried, and, and he just couldn't bring himself to write it, although his unpublished journals show an e- a facility with, with the English language and, and an authentic ability to express himself. Uh, now, you've written and edited several 
other books on the history of Egypt, uh, on some Egyptologists, um, and on the topic of Egyptology, what was something new that you learned in the preparation of this these volumes, uh, or, or something that you, you know, had no idea about before that you know doing this research opened your eyes to? Oh, I I would have to ask, answer that in almost transcendental terms. Uh, I think I learned that the enlightenment uh, comes often comes from the the effort, uh, not 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 finding the answer. Uh, you know, I was my approach was necessarily. Uh, uh, comprehensive and one of I think an underlying question was what makes ancient Egypt special why do we bother uh, what is it that provokes a response unlike any other ancient culture even children uh, my son when he was in Egypt with me at, at age six. I mean, as soon as he saw anything having to do with Pharaonic Egypt, he, he was he, he was entranced. And there for years, when he would go with me out in the field, I, I'd have trouble keeping a pencil and paper because he would be making transcriptions of, of his own. And this, this is not... A, a, this is not a unique reaction. Uh, it, ancient Egypt evokes a response, uh, one that sometimes uh, irritates Mesopotamian archaeologists and, and scholars because they say, well, our culture is just as ancient. We have big monuments. We have a written language. We have two rivers. Egypt has just 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 one what is it that uh, makes it so special and i think i found little bits and and, and pieces but it, at, at the end of the day the the answer is still just just over the horizon maybe perhaps that is the very thing that that leads people on when august mariette was uh, talking about uh, the decision to become an Egyptologist, he said, it's the duck. He was uh, referring uh, to the, the, the duck in, in the, in, in the uh, pharaonic honorific, you know, son, sa, which, which means both son and, it's a homophone, it says both son and duck, uh, so, uh, son of Ra. It was for a long time almost the only uh, hieroglyph for which these early uh, Egyptologists uh, knew the meaning, uh, thanks uh, to the ancient leader, uh, for Apollo. And he said, well, that's it. The, the duck bites you, injects its venom, and, and there you are, an Egyptologist uh, for, for, for life. And his explanation, as of now, I find as conclusive as, as any. Yeah, that Egyptian duck is still biting people today. You know, you you look and eat, the history of ancient Egypt is an important part of you know early elementary American school curriculum, and and so it's sort of still reinforcing and getting people to be interested uh, in Egyptology. I think w one of the most um, interesting chapters for me to read was in Volume Two, when Egyptology comes to America, and it touched on how anthropologists and some phrenologists did quote unquote studies of these mummies that showed that, you know, that, that they used to then support their own um, you know, racist white supremacist defense of slavery in America. Um, and it just shows that in the 19th century, especially Egyptology really became this global phenomenon and, and that it had an impact far beyond just how just the study of, you know, ancient Egypt and inscriptions and Egyptian history. Yes, there was something extraordinary about the advent of, of, of Egyptology in the, in the United States. And, and for that reason, uh, 
although uh, wonderful things is in general uh, constructive, a structure is a chronological narrative. Uh, in the case of the United States, uh, I treated uh, uh, the early development before 1882, uh, which is where volume two uh, uh, generally begins, uh, there as a whole, with, with, it, with its uh, merging into professional uh, e Egyptology in, in, in the United States, uh, it's, it is quite a story and it uh, illuminates uh, so many of the uh, aspects of uh, American ideologies and, and uh, prejudices through through the very unique lens of ancient Egypt. Now, another thing that this series uh, touches on is that the history of Egyptology can can also be seen as a history of sort of Western expropriation of Egyptian cultural heritage. Sometimes it's more or less restricted depending on the regime in charge. But Egyptology has almost always involved some sort of taking of artifacts, inscriptions, artworks, even full monuments out of Egypt. Um, recently, Egypt has renewed an initiative led by Zahi Hawass for the return of many of the important historical pieces that have been taken out of Egypt over the years. Um, do you see the attitude of Western countries and museums and collections changing at all? Do you foresee any sort of significant restitution movement, especially for objects that were maybe dubiously taken out of Egypt, like the limestone bust of Nefertiti in the Neues Museum in Berlin? Oh, <clears throat> during recent years, there, there have been several uh, uh, gestures of called return, sometimes rather than, than, than restitution. Uh, whether the uh, uh, bust of Nefertiti will return uh, to Egypt anytime soon is, uh, <clears throat> is questionable. Uh, I think history of Egyptology could be provide the answer to this if the, the facts were carefully examined and then the uh, processes were, 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 uh, were unraveled. Uh, a lot could be solved by asking, was the export legitimate? Now, it is a tragic fact that, say, uh, from the time of Maspero's director generalship onward, vast amounts of uh, Egyptian, <laughs> the material remains of Egyptian antiquity were, were, were exported. I mean, they had been before legally and Ill illegally, but it, it became a recognized process. Uh, Maspero was happy that the muse objects were housed were housed somewhere so one could examine the basic legality of it um, I think Zahi Awas would have been happy to have had the Rosetta stone uh, uh, returned but looking at the process it was actually legally exported perhaps a some Turkish, Ottoman Turkish authorities signed off on it. Perhaps the Egyptian people wished it had not been done, but it, at least it was done with some regularity. Now, there was some sleight of hand on that export of uh, the Nefertiti bust that, that, I, that I think uh, should, should be carefully considered, and the, the artifact... Uh, uh, kept where it properly properly belongs. Yeah, I, I recall in an undergraduate class on ancient Egypt, uh, <laughs> hearing that story of of the Nefertiti bust that it was caked in mud to obscure, you know, the the fine polychrome painting on it, or uh, it, it was only shown in passing to the representatives from the antiquities service, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, this series 
does a great job of touching on is the tensions sometimes between Western and Egyptian Egyptologists. And for a long time, many Western Egyptologists held ideas about Egyptians, which meant that Egyptians were barred from studying their own history, or they weren't allowed to sort of be the ones in charge uh, of large scale excavations without a European archaeologist uh, as the director. And this, of course, changed during the 20th century over time. But some inklings of that way of thinking might still be around in the field today. So what, what can we learn from the history of Egyptology and, and from, you know, frequently and consistently reconsulting the history of Egyptology that makes the current and future field maybe more equitable? Uh, uh, to, to, I think to a su substantial degree, uh, that ideal uh, ha has, has been reached. Uh, a difficulty early on, of course, was uh, the, uh, the reluctance and refusal of uh, the uh, Western Egyptologist who uh, directed everything uh, to train uh, Egypt's promising e e Egyptians. Uh, this has been document documented uh, time and time again. Uh, such efforts that were made uh, foundered for lack of resources, and lack of resources means lack of will somewhere. Uh, Long-term uh, workers in Egypt, I suppose George Reisner would, would be a prime example of that, even after Egyptian independence, his relations with his uh, Egyptian workers his rices, his photographers, and so forth, uh, were, were, were close, intimate, familial. Uh, nevertheless, he never trained one Egyptian e e Egyptologist. And uh, <clears throat> he, I don't think he had a, 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 a good view of, of, of the Egyptians who, who were other Egyptians who were working at, at, at Giza. But that changed um, uh, early on. Uh, it, it, it was recognized. Uh, uh, one of the difficulties in, in the uh, 1920s and 1930s uh, that Egyptologists had with uh, Pierre Lacot, who was a director general of, of the service at that moment, they thought that he was obstinate, aloof, and unreasonable. Perhaps he, he was sometimes, but what they didn't understand was that the Egyptians were in charge and that he had to do things their, their own way. And that if people would, then, then things, then things could could be accomplished, and now, with uh, the international co connections, with the uh, understanding that that Egyptian antiquity is Egyptians, um, this this I uh, I think is. It, it, is it has achieved a, a level of uh, what you might call equitable, but you know there are other there are other dimensions too. One of the things that interested me, and that I pursued as as far as you know the limits of the format would enable me to do, was uh, women in Egyptology. Uh, Occasionally, I, I heard uh, complaints about my first two volumes uh, that there weren't enough women in them. <laughs> well, there, there weren't enough women in them for the reason that there, there weren't enough women. And then in the uh, 20th century, apart from superstars like uh, Amelia Edwards, and some other notable but less remembered people, there's a, uh, 
a progress uh, from uh, beginning in, in the pottery shed where, where uh, so many would be uh, found if they were to be found on site at all because, uh, of course, uh, Walter Emery was famous for allowing uh, no uh, women on his uh, operations at all, apart from his wife, who, who was site, site manager. Now, it's been quite a trajectory uh, because, of course, in recent decades, now uh, uh, women are occupying many, perhaps most, if a survey is to be made, of positions of, of power and influence uh, within Egyptology. All right. Well, I, uh, well, actually one, one more thing is one thing I found particularly interesting. Um, you mentioned Lacau and his, his decisions that maybe came from above him, uh, in the Egyptian government, uh, to make the antiquities partage or the division of antiquities, uh, after the, after excavation was completed, um, more restrictive for archeologists, uh, in around 1924 and how that decision led many prominent Egyptologists like Petrie to sort of pick up operations and move to Palestine, which recently came under British control after World War I and um, had a more liberal division of antiquities um, policy. So I found that note particularly interesting. But um, I think we've... Uh, oh, go ahead. No, I was just... That, that, that was... That's, that's very true. Uh, uh, some who... Went to to, to, to to Palestine. Found, later, found things difficult there, and of course Sudan as well, which was uh, that was uh, a, a bonanza for uh, Sudanese ar archaeology because things were less restrictive there, and and the government was quite helpful whenever it could be, especially with 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 rail transport and so forth. But it should be understood that once uh, La, uh, Laco was able to settle everyone down, things continued uh, quite well with uh, respect to Egyptian sensitivities, legalities, and, 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 and authority. The, the, the Division of spoils, regrettably, uh, continued the, the sale room at the Egyptian Museum uh, op operated. And uh, so the, the disruption or the interference, as uh, some Egyptologists considered it, was actually uh, not, not never so great as uh, they complained it was. Well, I think we've taken up uh, enough of your time today. So I just have one more question. Uh, what's next? Is, is there anything that you're currently working on that you can share with us? Give us a little teaser. Well, just now I'm midway uh, uh, through a, a, a project uh, about uh, Captain Sir Richard Francis Burton, the Victorian writer, explorer, and, and adventurer, uh, made the Hajj to Mecca, searched for the sources of the Nile and many, many other things and concluded with his famous translation of the uh, Arabian, Arabian Nights. This, uh, like uh, Egyptology, has taken me a lot of places. My approach is always more one of collective biography rather than focusing on, on a single person. And it's also taken me to Egypt because there is no escape uh, uh, from Egyptology because even Burton was involved with it. He knew people like Moret, Lenant de Belfond, and, and uh, Archibald Sacy. And, and many others, and uh, encourage the, the development of Egyptology. Long term, perhaps a, a return to the history of Egyptology uh, with uh, 
a, a video to, to demonstrate uh, some of its re remarkable pictorial dimension. All right, so another biography to look forward to sometime in the near future. As I mentioned, all three volumes of Wonderful Things, A History of Egyptology, are out now from American University and Cairo Press. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Sam. A pleasure on my end, too. All right, so tune in uh, for future episodes. Thank you. <laughs>